Buenos días con todos. Soy Carla Sainz, soy asesora regional. Good morning. De... I'm Carlos Carla Sainz, National Research Ethics for PAHO. The Bioethics Department is part of the Health Systems and Services Department. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this first webinar, which is part of a series of three sessions on the topic of indicators for health research ethics. Before letting you know what today's session would look like, I would like to make sure that you are listening to the simultaneous interpretation into English. You can click on the globe um, and choose English if you want to listen to the session in English. Vamos a, vamos, como decía, que vamos a so, tener... as I was saying, we are going to have a three session series on this topic, this being the first one. And let me tell you that PAHO's work on strengthening research ethics by using indicators is being funded by the Wellcome Trust. This first session will be followed by an additional two sessions on November 8th and November 15th. During this, in this session, we're gonna have a general overview on research ethics indicator. And in the upcoming sessions, we're going to be using the indicators to have an idea of what the region is doing in terms of research ethics in order to continue with the regional progress. The first session will be on the first set of indicators. And the second session, the one on November 15th, will be on the specific indicator for research on emergencies and disasters. The plan for this session is that I will begin by giving a presentation on in the indicators. After my presentation, we are going to receive comments from our colleagues from Panama and Peru, whom I'll introduce later. And they are gonna tell us about their experience in their countries using these research ethics indicators and talking about the significant progress that has been made in research ethics. After their presentations, we are going to hear from Sara Caracedo, PAHO's research ethics consultant, who will be moderating the session where I will come back and we will hear questions and answers on the indicators, their potential use, as well as how to, in general, uh, foster or encourage progress in research ethics in our region. We would very much appreciate it if you could use the chat and we will use it as well to introduce yourself, share resources and links, etc. And let us use the Q&A button for any questions that you may have on the indicators. And Sarah will collect those questions and I will answer those at the end of the session. Okay, without further ado, I will begin by telling you about this effort that PAHO is making in terms of research ethics. You will see that on the initial slide, we had not only our publication on indicators in both languages, but also the document from PAHO's member states from 2018 on the regional assessment to see where we are in terms of bioethics. The reason why we're having this session is that in that assessment, regional assessment or evaluation that we did with the member states, we noticed that for research ethics, even though a lot of progress had been made in our region, we still had some areas 
that needed to be more consolidated. And in general, our reflection was that what we were lacking was having a more comprehensive vision, a, a research ethics system-wide vision. And with excellent effort, we were making progress, but oftentimes we were focusing on a single component, be it a piece of regulation or strengthening committees or strengthening researchers or strengthening our health authorities that of oversees research ethics. However, by focusing on a single component rather than having a more system-wide vision or a comprehensive approach for research ethics, we kept running into issues or snags in our region. That is to say, we were unable to consolidate the progress that has been made in terms of research ethics. And that is why the, govern, PAHO, the PAHO governing bodies document from 2018 was a call for member states to make progress on research ethics with a system-wide vision. And in response to this call for action in our region, we at PAHO's bioethics regional program started working on developing a tool that would make that progress easier and with that system-wide vision. And that tool is indicators on research ethics that we're sharing with you today and that are available on the publication that Sarah Carracedo shared in both English and Spanish on the chat. I am now going to share the screen so you can see my presentation. Let me start by acknowledging that this effort from PAHO, of course, is not something in isolation or something that we're doing on our own, but rather with the support and commitment of many parties in the region. In developing these indicators, we assess and anal analyze or reviewed other indicators at PAHO. As you know, PAHO acts on its strategic plan and WHO's strategic plans usually uh, by using indicators. There, there's not a lot of bioethics indicators, but we started off by learning and becoming familiar with how they were working with indicators in other areas, in eradicating malaria or indicating maternal death or whatever the area might be. And having a clearer vision on how to build indicators and what is feasible to achieve through indicators and also what, how many indicators are considered reasonable. Because let me tell you that at the very beginning, we're talking about 30 indicators. And then we realized that an indicator is a progress tracker. And so we had to see the tip of the iceberg that was relevant for each topic. So basically, what points to progress is what we took into account. And therefore, we narrowed the amount of indicators and we try to develop indicators that would truly point to progress and that were truly comprehensive. Then we did a critical review on all the literature on um, ethics, research ethics indicators. And let me acknowledge the work by Liza Dawson, who was with us performing this review at PAHO as part of um, an exchange through with NHS. And after that, we come through all the literature and all the initiatives, even an, an initiative or an effort by WHO on this topic that has been been in the works since before 2012, we proceeded to consolidate the most promising indicators and 
we submitted to a subject matter expert review in the region. So we had a meeting in Washington, D.C. two years ago in the second half of 2019. And we were joined not only by Liza Dawson, who was collaborating through this PAHO, but also Sergio Surugi de Cicada from Brazil, Joe Million from the US, Florencia Luna from Argentina, and our dear Ana Sanchez from Panama, who unfortunately is no longer with us. And on behalf of the PAHO Secretariat, we, we had myself and my colleague Marcy Neal. Some of you have already seen these indicators, not only because we talked about on several sessions with the region when we're doing dialogue sessions or work with our um, sessions or workshops, but also because we published them on the Lancet. And that was for one reason, and that is that we saw that they created a pretty quick progress. And we thought it was important to share this experience with other countries and other regions, since we thought that using these indicators could open doors for other low and middle income countries that would like to make progress efficiently and effectively in strengthening research ethics. However, after that, COVID came around almost right away, and we have not had an opportunity until now to post the indicators with a, public, a publication in both English and Spanish um, coming from PAHO. Now, the strategy that we follow to develop these indicators focus on how to strengthen national research ethics system. And we followed a model that we didn't come up with, but rather it's a way that PAHO works for other areas. And we sought to identify strategic lines of action. And then for each strategic line of action, we identified specific objectives that had to be reached. And then for each objective, we uh, identified one or two indicators, two maximum per objective, that will enable us to show whether the countries or jurisdictions had in fact achieved that objective or reached that objective. So the strategic lines of action that we identified, well, the most obvious one, the one that was the guiding light to our process was to strengthen research ethics systems so they could be used to ensure that any research is done ethically. We know that we're making progress and we see that it, it is possible to have research um, be more ethical, but it's a, it has to be a system-wide approach to ensure that research is done ethically. And we, for that, we need a regulatory framework, we need an authority, we need ethics committees, researchers, and a series of different components that we tried to capture. Now, consistent with the 2019 PAHO governing directors documents, we saw that it was important to acknowledge as one of the strategic lines of action to strengthen our ethics preparedness for preparedness for emergencies, epidemics, and disasters. You must recall that the the last health emergency before the pandemic was in our region, and it was the Zika outbreak. And we thought that in order to make the importance of ethics preparedness more visible that has a research ethics component, it was important to break down this strategic line of action because it had to be visible and it, it wasn't enough to just include it as the first strategic line. So straight, strengthening our ethics preparedness for emergencies have components that are not related to research ethics, but 
there's at least one that is related to research ethics because research is a key component of emergency preparedness. Now I'm going to talk about for each one of these strategic lines of action, what the objectives are that we identified and for each objective, what the indicator that is measuring progress in a jurisdiction or country. The first objective that we identified was to adopt ethical standards for research with human beings according to international standards. International standards are mainly refer to the most comprehensive and up-to-date guidelines for research. Now, what was the indicator that we thought would be key to reach this objective for the country or jurisdiction to have a legally binding instrument, that is to say, not just a guideline or recommendation, but rather a legally binding document that would govern research with human beings. Now, what does this mean? That it's not just a subset of research with human beings, such as clinical trials. And for that tool to at least require all research with human beings have an ethics review from an independent committee. Now, I'm going to make a general comment on indicators. And that is that in the case of each one of the indicators, we try to find like a happy medium. That is to say, we try to have an indicator not be so demanding that it would discourage progress in a region. And at the same time, we didn't want it to be so complacent that it would not require any kind of change at all. So for each one of these indicators, we try to find the proper language for that indicator so that we could really have an idea that the indicator would kind of guide progress in our region. In the case of this specific indicator, the substance has to do with the scope of action. And I'm going to show you a slide a little bit later on showing how we proceeded and how we believe that at this point where we are in a mature stage for research ethics in our region, we had to aim for the region to have a tool for research ethics that was not just for a subset, but rather for research uh, re health research with human beings in general. The second objective for this strategic line of action was to establish effective mechanisms for ethical or oversight in research. We said that oversight or supervision plays a key role in research. However, it is very important to have mechanisms so that this fundamental role performed by research ethics committee adhere to a serious uh, of standards and is overseen. So the indicators in order to have these mechanisms in place is to have at least a national agency that is specifically tasked with overseeing these ethics review committees. This review has include establishing mechanisms to register the committees in areas relating to training, as well as compliance with the rules. The, re the rationale is that we're not going to have committee, committees uh, oversight unless there's an agency or some kind of entity that is tasked with overseeing these committees. So it is very important to have an entity with this specific role. And we believe that that was a, uh, an indicator that will enable us to measure progress. Now, the next objective for this strategic lines of action that has to do with strengthening national research ethics system is to increase 
capacity in ethics related topics, both in researchers and ethics review committees. The indicator that we picked to measure whether this objective was reached or not is to have policy supporting training in ethics for researchers and for ethics review committees. We know that our region gives a lot of training on ethics, on research ethics, but we know that that training is not all, not always a matter of policy, but rather when something goes wrong and as a reaction training is provided, or when we have some spare resources, then some kind of training is offered. And we know that these policies or training activities are not always aimed at researchers either. We know that in many places, there may be some kind of policy to provide training on for ethics committee, but not for researchers. And without this, we're not gonna make progress. In, researchers may not be left out because they are a key uh, player in ensuring that research is done ethically. So we believe that this indicator would help us push the region a little bit in this area. And at the same time, this was something that is considered reasonable and feasible. The final objective for this strategic line of action is to foster transparency and integrity in research. And we picked an indicator for transparency and an indicator for integrity. The indicator for transparency is that all countries should require a pre-registration of clinical trials uh, consistent with WHO standards. And these standards are from the IPSP platform. We know that oftentimes clinical trials are registered or some clinical um, trials are, for example, for medical devices or drugs. And sometimes uh, registration is not that beforehand, but rather afterwards. And we know that sometimes registration depends on whether there are international counterparts that might require registration. We know that there are a lot of registration efforts by our health authorities that are very valuable. But these efforts, these registration efforts, do not necessarily take place in agreement with WHO standards, which identify a series of required fields to for clinical trials and makes registration standard. So the indicator that we thought was the right one was for each country to require this pre-registration for clinical trials according to or consistent with WHO's standards. Now, in terms of the second component of this objective, the indicator is to have policies on responsible research behavior. This is a topic that's highly sensitive in our region. You must remember that it's a, a little bit new for our national bioethics program because we have focused on other aspects of research ethics, but many countries in our region have insisted on the importance for research to be done ethically, not only because participants are protected and not only because uh, internet tra uh, transparency standards are followed, but because there's no counterfeiting, there's no plagiarism, etc. And this is something that oftentimes countries in their region have insisted on and said that this is an area that we needed to reinforce. And that is why we included that as part of our indicators. Finally, in terms of a second strategic line of action that has to do with ethic preparedness for emergencies. My apologies for the background noises, a helicopter nearby. 
for the strategic line of action, like I was saying, of prepare, ethical preparedness for emergencies. The objective was to strengthen our capability of doing research ethically during emergencies, epidemics, and disasters. And the indicator is to have procedures in place to perform an ethical review in a rigorous but accelerated way for research during health emergencies. I believe that when we thought about these indicators, when we developed them and when we fine tuned them, we obviously did not have a way to know how urgent it was going to be for us to act on this indicator because we did not know, of course, that the pandemic was coming. But I believe that having put this topic in black and white starting in 2019 in the PAHO member states documents, and since 2019, it to include as part of our indicators to have Put it to put it in our regional agenda was key because once the pandemic kicked in, we were able to provide quick response. And like I said at the beginning, during our November 15th session, we're going to focus on this indicator specifically, that is to say where we are in the region in terms of its indicator. And in the previous session, the one on November 8th, we're going to focus on all of the indicators and the regional outlook, but outlook by using the indicators for the previous strategic line of action. That is to say indicators one through five. As I was saying a few minutes ago, we can see that there's a, a sort of trajectory to make progress in research ethics in the region. And when we assess each country or area by using these indicators, we see that in many places, what we have is uh, ethics governance for research, but only for a very limited subset in, within research such as clinical trials for medical devices and drugs. So the progress, the, the, the spectrum of research ethics governance goes to all clinical trials, to all research by on biomedics and all research with human beings. So this, this is the kind of progress that we want to achieve. And we thought that in terms of at least indicator number one, doing ethics research and having a legally binding document to ensure research ethics takes place, we needed to take the into account the full spectrum of research with human beings and, and knowing the whole way from where we come from and where we're trying to get to. And also being aware that once we hit that maturity level for research ethics in our region, we had the responsibility of ensuring that we had uh, ethic governance of research with human beings in every single instance, not in just some of them. When we began using the indicators as analysis uh, specifications for each country in 2019, we noticed that indicators really served as catalysts for progress in the region. And our colleagues in Panama and Peru will discuss a little bit about their respective experiences. You will see that in the publication of these indicators that we've already shared in the chat room, there is a way to download a word format form that allows you to assess the current status of indicators in each country. So we can see what the current status is for these indicators in each country, and we could see that countries could conduct their assessments and evaluations and when observing any non-compliance for any of the indicators they could then move to come up with a solution and in many of these cases the proposal was to establish research ethics national policy that i recognize was uh, 
suggestion from our colleagues in Trinidad and Tobago. And this is now a policy that is awaiting the final approval. So as a result, we observed that by proposing this vision, using these indicators represented a paradigm change. We're not just looking at components, but rather the systemic overview of research ethics, then this will lead to us changing how we do business, basically, but it also allows us to consolidate a lot of the advances that we've achieved in the region. Again, this is a very useful mechanism that began as an idea proposal by Trinity, uh, Trinidad and Tobago and has led to becoming a policy. And in many other areas, we've been working on legislation to ensure proper research ethics governance. There are different instruments that could be suitable depending on the scenario, but we want to point out that a national policy could be a very successful instrument to achieve the same purpose. If it's a national policy or legislation or, or an instrument with any other name, we believe as part of the PAHO National Research Ethics Program, we will be supporting the entire journey from the initial steps, the review process. All of this is a process that really takes on all of the relevant issues from a systemic or system-wide standpoint. And this involves all of the key stakeholders. And in many regards, we have facilitated some of these sessions and these review procedures involving these documents can be can be rather difficult in the sense that we need to be very careful with the language as well as the specifications that we include in documents of that nature. In many of the cases, what a document, a policy of this nature does is not necessarily propose something new, but rather it formalizes many tasks that are already undertaken in many places, but are not required or are not mandatory. So it allows us to formalize many different activities and tasks that already exist and are already being executed. But what we do is standardize them and formalize them. And so with this systematic view, we can also distribute roles and responsibilities. We understand that the health authorities have a key role in research ethics, but we also have researchers, we have research institutions, we have financing institutions, we have ethics committees. And so we need to try to identify the appropriate role for each component, each stakeholder in order to ensure proper research ethics for any research project that is undertaken. So if we can achieve some clarity and transparency at a foundational level, then this will make everything much more accountable. And it will also ensure that all research is undertaken under the proper ethical framework. Now this can serve as a great tool and these could be very powerful drivers for the work that we conduct in our region. If in five years, every member country in the region can achieve full compliance with the indicators and we can use these indicators and perhaps even develop others to continue on our journey beyond the horizon. And so these are tools that will continuously allow us to achieve progress. Now, before I yield the floor to our colleagues from Panama and Peru, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Additionally, I'd like to invite you to visit the PAHO Regional Bioethics Program website so that you can access different instruments and documents, videos, photographs, and other academic publications. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter where we provide information regarding other future events that we will be carrying out.
One of them will be on November 3rd and the other one on November 15th. We will offer simultaneous interpretation services for both of those sessions. And this will be all sponsored by the Welcome Trust. So with that, I will stop sharing my presentation and slides. And now I'd like to introduce our wonderful colleagues, wonderful collaborators for the PAHO Bioethics Program, Dr. Argentina Ying from Panama and Dr. Yamile Hurtado Roca from Peru. I will yield the floor first to Dr. Argentina Ying, president of the National Bioethics Committee and Research Committee in Panama and Dr. Yamile Hurtado Roca is director of OJIT, which is a part of the National Health Institute in Peru. And OJIT is the General Office of Technology, Technology Research and Transfer. They join us here today because both Panama and Peru have had a very firm commitment for a long time to achieve real progress in research ethics programs. And so Argentina, I will yield the floor first to you and then Yamile. Thank you, Carla. I feel very honored to be invited to participate in this seminar and in this discussion. I think that undoubtedly PAHO's indicators have been very useful to us and as Carla stated, they have served as catalysts for the advances that we've achieved. We were able to self-assess our status, to understand what our current status was and how to move forward. I'm gonna be giving a very brief uh, presentation, but I also wanted to recognize Dr. Ana Sanchez, whose presence in the national committee in our country, we were able to achieve a proper alignment of the planets, as they say, and progress uh, extensively in our work and having an expert of her caliber supporting our efforts, it allowed us to move our work much further and in a much more expedited way. And it is important to understand that we have made some strong gains largely due to her and other collaborators and i just wanted to recognize them for that let me now go to my screen share and tell you a little bit about our story we do have legislation in place the national bioethics research commission was created in the Congress through legislation, and it focuses on um, research ethics, and it involves a broad array of stakeholders that work on the policy front. For me, it's important to share the experience related to how we managed to bring about these public policies. This was not an easy task. It was a very long and very difficult road. In 2014, we began a process that lasted four years and nine months. Of course, along the way, we ran into a number of obstacles. It's not easy to move uh, this type of concept uh, through all the various channels, but after more than 100 meetings with the participation of more than 300 people, including public consultations, addressing all of these ethical considerations, we were able to develop a document, a very strong standard that allows us to provide adequate ethical oversight for research projects and allows a framework for researchers to carry out their work. 
So during this four year, nine month period, almost five years, we managed to get to this final instrument. And after that, in 2017, we proposed this to our General Assembly. 2017, 2018, we conducted a lot of a lot of lobbying and the first uh, debate on the bill was conducted in October of 2018. And this was followed by other ventures that finally led to the legislation being enacted. So now we have current legislation, law number 84, that regulates and promotes research for health and establishes the necessary ethical protocols and standards. So in Article 11, it reads that the Ministry of Health through the National Bioethics Research Commission will provide oversight for research projects. Now, in terms of the functions of the CNBI, we've talked about how important the indicators are for research and training, but part of the legislation includes providing training periodically on research ethics as well as ethical decision making and we have programs that the national commission needs to put into effect as part of the requirements of the legislation and so each one of the participating entities has to have the appropriate program We also had the executive decree number 1843. And I mentioned this because since we still don't have the regulations approved to enforce the law, there are a number of points that we still need to resolve. And so this decree number 1843, which was issued on December 16, 2014, it's right now the governing document. Now we also had resolution number 512 that was issued in june 18th of 2019 and that was followed by number 373 april 2020 and lastly number 400 that is issued this year now 373 addresses uh, emergency conditions uh, and crises and this was uh, amended later on and we basically modified the time frames, the terms, especially given the experience that we had with the most recent pandemic. And so we needed to expand the guidelines to be able to address these types of events. But thanks to these indicators and thanks to the political will that we had in our country, as well as uh, Pajo's support, we came up with uh, operational procedure 026 that refers to accelerated ethical review under certain circumstances involving devices and medications research all of these efforts led to us being able to make the progress that we needed to make and what we highlight here in yellow indicates that we created the national registry platform for research in the health arena. And we have here resolution number 400 issued on June 7th, 2020. So we conducted a self-assessment exercise to determine what our status was with regard to the PAHO subset of indicators and clearly uh, I would say as many as 90% of these uh, indicators required a lot of work. I submitted a proposal for the National Research Ethics System in Panama to conduct a training program with other key stakeholders. And in so doing, we could try to address some of these challenges and start filling in some of the gaps related to the indicators that we have in country. With that, I conclude my remarks, uh, thanking you once again for the invitation to take part in this event. 
and I yield the floor back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Argentina. Now we will yield the floor to Yamile Hurtado from Peru. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you for the invitation that Pajo extended to us to be able to participate in this discussion. As Carla mentioned, I direct the Office of Technolog Technological Research and Transfer as part of the National Health Institute in Peru. And our division has oversight authority over the health sector. I wanted to mention that I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Carracedo for having provided materials to me. This was done previously to my intervention, but I did want to speak a little bit about some of the applications that we have uh, engaged in by using this tool as part of uh, our efforts in our system. As Argentina mentioned, we've seen some very solid results that I'd like to report on. This tool, and I want to address its utility primarily. First and foremost, uh, in Peru, what it allowed us to do was to undertake an initial situational self-assessment. So based on these PAHO indicators, we were able to address some of the systems that deal with uh, human beings, and we wanted to assess what our current status was in country. So we looked at each one of the objectives and we started to notice that with regard to ethical standards involving research with human trials, we did in fact have, or we still have some standards in place And these standards uh, were in place to provide oversight for human trials. But this wasn't a generalized program, but rather a very um, restrictive subset of standards that addressed only human trials. And so we tried to look at the execution, execution issues, and we understood that that part of it at least was uh, regulated in some way. Now, when we talk about research ethics at our National Health Institute and in our Office of Technological Research and Transfer, we took on the role of supervising some of these ethical committees, as well as oversight authority for any clinical human trials. And the office didn't really have uh, the authority to provide oversight uh, by and large, but as part of our function within the overall institution, then we were just serving as a support office. We could not uh, take on the entire oversight authority for the entire nation. And so we were just, uh, again, regulating clinical human trials. In terms of the training of uh, ethics, uh, research ethics committee members and researchers, we placed a greater emphasis on those committees that primarily work in assessing clinical trials. But in our country, not all of these ethics committees are registered or even certified to assess clinical trials. So in those cases where those committees did not uh, develop these uh, assessments, we determined that they weren't uh, really capable to undertake some of these uh, scientific and ethical considerations to be able to provide adequate oversight and review authority for research involving human clinical trials. Now, when we talk about uh, providing oversight uh, uh, on the systemic uh, scale, we wanted to use these basic standards um, 
applied to clinical trials and use a, a platform that would include all of these standards and we use data from 2017 to build this platform but we didn't have any legislation that made it mandatory for us to uh, oblige different committees or entities to register their efforts uh, at the national level as i mentioned previously we did have legislation in place in our country for tuberculosis research. There is a platform that has existed and that has been managed by the National Health Institute in that regard. And afterwards, we saw different uh, registries uh, for other types of uh, diseases, uh, including COVID, but regarding other research projects that involve human beings that are that fall outside of those particular topics, there was no real standard framework that could impose any kind of protocol or mandatory framework. In terms of policy for research ethics, we'd never had a national policy. And when talking about emergency preparedness and response, we didn't have any specific document or instrument that would allow us to have a protocol in, pay, in place to address uh, these emergency type situations. But once we used these tools and once we conducted a situational self-assessment, we could see that uh, there were some very specific uh, standards applied to small clinical groups, but also highlighted uh, the absence of any kind of uh, framework outside of those conditions. Then last year, we started to promote and enact uh, this new standard framework uh, at the national level. This was a decision made at the ministry level and was ratified by the minister who was in at that time. And we created this ministerial resolution that provides oversight for any research involving human beings. And so this doesn't just address clinical trials, but overall uh, human involvement in any research. So this was a result of the situational self-assessment that we conducted. We identified the gaps. And as a result, we developed standards, in this case, for a national policy. After this, we moved on to other areas using the same tools and this allowed us to address the ethical standards for research involving human beings and not just in clinical trials but now that we had the national policy we were able to map out the entire regional landscape that involved the human beings we developed the more efficient mechanisms for the ethical oversight of research projects. And we then created the framework to provide oversight for all of the technical ethical committees involving any research that involves human beings. We've been working and in fact, we continue to work on a registration procedure document for ethics committees. We're also working to develop a registry platform for these types of committees so that they can also be transferred to any citizen that has interest in consulting the information. We've conducted extensive training for researchers and ethics committees members. And now that we have the uh, national policy, though not the uh, national legislation, this technical document establishes that these committees need to provide training on ethics to both researchers as well as the ethics committee members in the entire nation. So now we have a standard support framework that allows us and has allowed us to undertake training activities, not just for committee members, but also for researchers in our country. Regarding transparency and integrity in research projects, 
this technical document, it establishes that research needs to be recorded in a public registry. The institution has a platform that uh, they can use to register any projects. Previously, there was no mandatory requirement to register any research undertaken, but once this standard was put into place, this became a mandatory requirement. So any research conducted on human beings needs to be recorded and registered on this platform where we do need to work on a little bit more at the national level and at the institutional level is expanding this platform because we do have a, a good registry for research uh, involving human beings being carried out in our country but we also need to expand the capability for the platform and this is something that's very important in terms uh, on in terms of a responsible conduct in research policies, then the technical document has a section that addresses responsible conduct in a research project and it specifies the fabrication, falsification or plagiarism issues. During the pandemic, we've seen a lot of research and we have seen a number of cases, two in particular, that didn't have anything to do with clinical trials, but it did have something to do with observational studies involving human research. And we've seen researchers that did not behave in a responsible professional way. So these technical standards allow us to intervene in those types of situations. In terms of the strategic action lines for emergency pre preparedness and response, this document also includes procedures and mechanisms that ensure a more rapid review process, but notwithstanding no less rigorous than the typical review process. And all of this is based on the most recent experience. And so this has allowed us to really take an, ex an important step in trying to establish where the gaps uh, are still located. We had a, a huge uh, absence of uh, a national standard. And as a country and as an institution through the use of these mechanisms and all stemming from the situational self-assessment has allowed us to address any research involving human beings in our country in a much more comprehensive way. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to both of you. It's very interesting to hear how with different strategies and institutional mechanisms, such as a national research bioethics committee or as part of Vigit, you were able to make progress in both countries and reach uh, the objectives and meet the indicators. I believe that this is something very important to clarify because we know that there's a, a lot of diversity in our region. And to put it in simple terms, we know that the pie could be cut in a lot of different ways. And we have to be respectful of those differences and these of the different history paths. There might be a time when in one location, one of the agencies might be the best candidate to do this and in a different area or region it may not. So I believe that the different indicators enable us to assess each country's situation individually with a, a, a single standard. And so we're going to have our sessions on November 8th and November 15th to talk about what the situation is like in our region, because it's not a matter of answering yes or no, but rather we're all making progress. So we learn when we know how to move forward and how others are moving forward, because that enables us to see what we're missing, 
what is still left to do. Sara Saracedo, bioethics consultant for the regional bioethics program, will now help us with the questions from the audience. So thank you so much, Argentina and Yamile, for sharing your experience from your respective countries. You're representing entire teams. We know it's not just you. In Panama, Argentina, you mentioned that there was, she played a key role in developing indicators, but Jessica Candanedo also did a lot. So we have worked with Jessica from the Ministry of Health in developing the legislation and everything that came after that. In the case of Yamile, she was telling us how to, has been in Ojit for not that long and how they continued the work from the previous administration and the different administrations uh, kept the objectives clear. In Peru, Hans Bas, who's the person that had Yamile's position when we sent you the first version of the indicators, called me and said, no way, so much work and we're still, you know, at this point. So I believe that Panama's and Peru's achievements just are examples of the progress that has been made in the region. They are highly committed teams that are, have stayed with us because things don't happen, happen overnight. So thank you so much for being with us. And Sarah will give the floor to you to moderate the questions and answers session. Thank you, Carla. And thank you, Yamile Argentina for joining us today and sharing your experience with these indicators in Peru and Panama. There are several questions. So I've tried to group them together. The first one has to do with the first indicator that has to do with governance. In a lot of countries, there have been progress by subsets, like you mentioned. So what do we mean when we say that governance should cover the entire research with human beings, especially if we take into account the role that regulatory agencies play, that is to say, what role do we play in achieving governance and promoting research ethics? And even how can we overcome the fact that the role of regulatory agencies is fragmented at times by types of research? Thank you so much, Sarah, for that question. I believe this is a very important question that relates to two components. On the first, the, on the one hand, the trajectory, the progress that has been made. A lot of the ethics research or research ethics standards were adopted in our region for one type of research. However, all research should be um, done ethically. So in a lot of places, for example, Peru, going back to what Yamile was saying, is an, Peru is an excellent example. Initially, you had a very well-established governance, but only for clinical trials for medical devices and, and medication. So the challenge was not only to have that type of research be ethical, but all types of research. Uh, to be done ethically. But that is one component. I believe that the other important component that we need to take into account is diversity, not only of roles, but also guidance for the different types of research, taking into account that we come from bioethics as a discipline when we understand these issues. You must understand the science standards, ethics guidelines for human research from 2016. This covers all human research areas. However, the previous version, the 2016 science version replaced not one, but two 
documents. One for biomedical guidelines, but in, and also another one for clean and biological research in 2019. So there was there was an idea that there were different types of guidance for different types of research. But one of the most significant contributions from the current SIOMS guidelines is that they make it clear that this is for all types of human research. However, I believe it's also important to bear in mind that there are requirements or clearance or authorizations that might be relevant for a subset. And I'm going to give you the, 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 the broadest example. Best clinical practices are the standard for medical supplies and, and drugs, but not for all types of human research. They are not a standard for epidemiological research, for example. While I was listening to you, I was trying to kind of show a drawing of what this challenge is like. We talk about having a clinical trial registration. So at least all clinical trials should be registered and all human research must undergo an, ethicals review, an ethics review process. But there are certain authorizations issued from the national regulatory authorities that are relevant only to authorize medical supplies and, and drugs or, or medicine. So having clarity on the different levels and think about it, you know, with a sort of lasagna that has a wider base and a narrower top layer, we are going to be able to identify what we need to do for all, for all types of research. The most obvious example is that we need to avoid plagiarism, counterfeiting. That should, of course, apply to all types of research, not just the ones that for human, not just human research. So it's important to try to have ethics governance cover all human research or health research, but also to ensure that we don't apply a guideline or criteria requirement to a broader group that's only relevant for a small subset of that bigger group. And we as the regional bioethics program are providing support to our member states in making all of these uh, distinctions that might complicate things a little bit. Thank you so much, Carla, for your answer. Now, the second question has to do with ethics committee oversight, their operations and ethics review in the country. And in several countries, the formula that's been used is to have a national bioethics committee. But like you said, and like the question said, it's not the only way because there's a lot of diversity in all of the countries in the region, right? So could you give us a little bit more detail about that to know what other, for example, agencies or bodies could provide oversight on the committees, especially taking into account that in some countries there's a lot of ethics committees and not enough resources for health research, which is a concern that has come up in the questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. I believe that this question addresses a topic that may be the hardest thing to discuss because a lot of health authorities say we need to make sure that somebody provides oversight or training or accreditation or registration or whatever for ethics committee. So who, who should do that? What's the best um, agency or entity? Well, there's not a, a single answer. We need to know what agencies exist, what mandate they have, whether they work or not work. And we also have to think about that this is not going to be a month-long commitment. We see how sustainable a proposal can be over time and how many resources should be allocated so that this is not a short-lived effort. In the region, we have a lot of options available to us. And this is the case where when we have to develop the indicators, 
made us reflect more on the importance of having a clear objective. Rather than seeing what we want, we have to ask what for, what are we trying to achieve? What are we doing this for? We know that there are countries we have, for example, CONEP in Brazil, the National Ethics Committee that has the role of being the agency that supervises ethics committees. And in other countries, there, there is um, the subdivision of the health authorities such as in Peru. And in some other countries, for example, the National Research Bioethics Committee, like Argentina was saying, was set up with this objective precisely. And other countries have commissions, commission committees on bioethics whose mandate has absolutely nothing to do with research ethics oversight. These are agencies or units that reflect on certain bioethics related matter, but they do not provide oversight. So the answer is that there's no a silver bullet. And also there are some agencies, and again, Peru comes to mind where the OJIT that originally had a mandate to provide oversight of the committees that reviewed clinical trials with medical supplies and drugs had been created with as with the mandate of being a leader for ethics or research ethics so we want to make sure that the task is done that is done properly and that it's done in a sustainable way and the first step in any given jurisdiction is to see what agencies or units already exist, what they're doing, what's missing, and what the best way would be to achieve what we're looking for. In our experience, and I'm thinking about all the conversations we've, we've had with, for example, Guatemala, where they have a proposed national research ethics policy that was developed in the previous administration. And we had a lot of discussions because not only is it not obvious for an outsider, but rather, but also for the players that are working in the country with, you know, on different tasks, it may not be obvious to decide who the best or which the best agency is to do this. And just an additional clarification that I believe is always good to have in mind. And that is that we may have this one national entity or agency charged with overseeing ethics committee that can also fulfill the role of the ethics committee, such as the case of Panama or Peru, or they may play no role regard, uh, related to ethics review or oversight, but rather do everything else without the agency itself being an ethics committee. So we need to see, like I said, what the best solution is for each case, taking into account the current, what we already have and what the best way to perform their tasks is. Thank you so much for that answer. We have a few more minutes, so we can have a couple more minutes. And one of them has to do with something that you mentioned at the beginning regarding this indicator that relates to clinical trial registration. A lot of countries already have this registration. They have provided, they have given priority to this clinical trial registration, even if they don't meet the OM, WHO um, standards. So, could you tell us a little bit why it's so important or why is it not enough to have a, a database, but also to have it adhere to WHO standards? And uh, the second part of the question before giving the floor to you, so you can tie those things together. Why only, why a requirement only for clinical trials rather than making it extensive to all uh, health research? There are plans, are there plans to make it extensive to all health research? Because some countries of the region are already doing that. Thank you very much, Sara. I included in the chat a link to the ethical documents related to COVID that addresses a number of the topics related to the importance of transparency in research. I think that more than ever during the pandemic, we've come to realize 
the importance of being able to know in the most rapid way possible what research is being conducted in the rest of the world. Now, in order for us to understand what kind of research is being conducted in, in other parts of the world, it would not be feasible or possible or practical to look at 300, 400, however there, there may be registries at the national, provincial, international level. What we need is to be able to consult all of that in a single database. That is the ICTRP concept that was developed by the WHO. So it's a platform, a single platform that can be nourished by all of the primary accredited registries that have been authorized by the WHO. Why? Well, because they provide information to the platform, they are qualified and accredited, and they include various fields that are mandatory for the proposal of the, any research. You all know that uh, there are a number of uh, primary registries that are connected to the TCRP. We have others uh, all over the world, REPEC in Peru, REPEC in Brazil. But what we have is a type of a subset of national registries that are not necessarily providing information to the WHO's platform. And so in order to achieve this connection, the WHO engages in an accreditation process. They need to ensure that the information is taken on in the required way by ICTRP. And it also needs to meet the electronic requirements that will ensure a proper connection. Now, this is far beyond my specialty because it's more of an IT issue. Nevertheless, something that needs to be cleared up that is very basic is that we don't need each country in the region to have their own registry accredited by the WHO. What we really need is for each country in the region to require that any clinical trials that are broadly defined by the WHO, that all clinical trials be registered in any of the accredited platforms that has gotten the stamp of approval from the WHO. If that registry is in the US or South Africa, it doesn't matter, but the country needs to require that the registration process take place in a WHO accredited platform. And it may not be one that's in country. So if the country can submit this registry through an accredited WHO, WHO platform, then as a bioethics research uh, regional program, we could uh, coordinate with WHO, with our colleague Hugo Bates in the region, who is in charge of these registries for the Americas region. Now, there's another point that Sarah mentioned in her question that is very important. When we talk about registering clinical trials, and when you go to the ICTRP platform, you'll see that it's a platform for the registration of clinical trials. And that's defined with, as any study that has any kind of intervention arm. Regardless of whether these interventions are pharmacological or not, nevertheless, you may remember that if you go to this Helsinki Declaration of 2013, it states that it's not just or clinical trials that need to be registered and available to the public at large, but any research involving human beings needs to be registered. And those of us at PAHO are in complete agreement with all human-related research being registered. And we believe that that is where we need to achieve in conjunction with these ethical demands and ethical and other requirements by ICTRP so that it can be 
a registry, not just for clinical trials, but a registry for any human research undertaken anywhere in the world. It may be in some cases that one country records the number of participants and in another one they don't. And so we need to ensure proper alignment with all the rules and regulations. At the present time, a number of countries have a solution of this type. They have a mechanism to register research as part of the health authority website. And this is all research that has been approved by the respective committee. So there's a way to collect the information about all of the information involving human beings that is being conducted within a country. Some of these initiatives have been you know, driven by the pandemic. In other cases, such as in Argentina, they have the National COVID Observation or National COVID Observatory. And in other countries, they saw the need to record and register all of the clinical trials that are approved by the national authority. But we believe that we still need to clarify some of the concepts related to this topic. And as I stated at the beginning of the session, indicators are a tool for us as a region to use to advance our purpose. And so if we become too exigent, too rigorous with our indicators, they will be so difficult to achieve that they won't be really serving any purpose in guiding the process. So we've tried to work very hard on this fair middle point and based on the fact that the Helsinki Declaration calls for the registration of any and all human research, then the platform that the WHO has at the present time that's only primarily geared towards clinical trials, we think needs to be updated and we need to try to meet these uh, clinical trial standards uh, required by the ICTRP in all countries. And so this will lead to a broadening of the subset of indicators. This will let the international community know that as a region, we are moving forward in our goals related to any research being conducted on human beings. That's our guiding light that we always have to keep in mind. Thank you, Carla. One question about the scientific integrity indicator. And the question is, how do you find this for the purposes of the indicator, given that, as you stated, we're talking about indicators for research in general, not necessarily for research involving human beings. And how are we going to drive this topic in the region? Because if we look at research ethics, this has been put on the back burner for some time. And in fact, it's been left behind for too long. Well, it is an interesting question because this whole issue related to responsible conduct and research and scientific integrity in the literature, they are addressed as a separate topic and more of a compliance issue and not so much related to research ethics and standards involved in conducting ethical research and providing ethical treatment to research subjects. And so I think it's always been that framework, that particular standpoint. But the idea is that data and indicators are here to help us. And many colleagues in the region made us understand that if we didn't really begin to include and talk about scientific integrity and include at least the seeds of responsible ethical conduct in research, we were losing an opportunity, leaving that behind. And when asked on how to engage in ethical research, we were looking primarily at fabrication and what have you. And so we thought that we needed to have a definition that relates to what we're talking about when we talk about scientific integrity. What are the key concepts that define it? You mentioned them, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, as well as standards. 
for authorship. So I think that once again, this is an area in which we still have a long way to go in our region. And we also have to think on the institutional tasks, the work that each institution needs to undergo or undertake to ensure these ethical standards. But at the very least, we need to put this on the table, understanding that the indicator in order to be complied with needs to be in close alignment with these key concepts that define all of these these ethics and standards. Uh, we need to come up with definitions on why you cannot fabricate or plagiarize or falsify, what have you. Thank you. And the last question, which is more of a practical issue, poses the following. How can countries know concretely where they are currently positioned and given the opportunity in assessing what their current status is, how can they achieve full compliance for indicators and by and large, where is the starting point? Especially if they've never been able to sit at the same table and look at whatever progress they have made. If you go to the publication itself, you can see that towards the end, there's an icon that says um, download the evaluation or assessment form. And we, be we believe that this assessment exercise is not only important at the national level. We know, for example, that in Argentina, a federal nation, they've gotten indicators uh, at the provincial level. So we know that there's a huge commitment in our region for making improvements in research ethics. And our desire is to make sure that these indicators don't just provide order and guidance for some advancement, but also that they will provide a more comprehensive picture of the entire landscape and not so much information about a specific situation. At PAHO, our task is to work on collaboration efforts on research ethics, bioethic, uh, res bioethical research with all the member states. And in 2019, we've extended, we've initiated uh, technical collaboration projects. And now we start by thinking, instead of trying to address very specific items, why can't we look at trying to improve the entire national system on research ethics. And why don't we start by the indicators conducting this self-assessment at the country level and based on the results of the assessment, how can we develop an agenda to address the issues that are observed? Many of these exercises include the health authority. In the beginning, as we used to say, we need to be very inclusive. We need to give everybody a seat at the table. This doesn't necessarily happen or if it doesn't happen at the beginning, and somebody from Bolivia posed a question along these lines. Bolivia is one of those countries where we've engaged in this exercise. We've uh, had this process of reflecting and we've been considering the broad system there. Everybody can undertake their own analysis, their own thought process, but the idea for these indicators is that they they be public information. Anybody who wants to consult them and use them can and should. Nevertheless, the most valuable information is the one that you find in the details. And it'll lead you to think, well, maybe we didn't achieve this or we don't have an X framework, but, but we did manage to do this. And so this helps people achieve greater clarity, even if they don't comply with the indicator, it provides more insight as to where you're headed. And so how can we consolidate this process based on the WHO guidelines and standards? We know that uh, there's some review conducted with 
human research, but that's not so much part of a mandate, but rather the goodwill of some of the key stakeholders. But wherever there is no goodwill, then things really don't happen. So in order for us to consolidate a national research ethics policy, we can't just start from a clean slate. We need to formalize many of the things that already take place. And this gets us back to a question that was posed about the institutional commitment, the commitment of the uh, authorities. In our experience, having worked on indicators in different countries in the region and having engaged in different discussions to ensure that these indicators are adopted, what we have observed is a very, very positive re reaction by all the key stakeholders. And so we're moving forward step by step and you can see that they really want to consolidate and formalize their existing procedures because all ethics committees that do good work want to ensure that other ethics committees do good work. So the attitude that we were faced with in our discussions with the various countries was very positive in the sense that it isn't so much that you're trying to go against the grain, but rather quite the contrary. There is a grain or there's a current that needs direction that wants to be directed. And so from that standpoint, uh, we could come up with a practical and useful application for these indicators. And therefore, I believe that there's a great deal that we have to do. There are many interesting questions. This is the first of three sessions that we will be having. It's a series of sessions that we will be having on the issue of indicators. The second session will take place on November 8th. Sara will be with us. Uh, and additionally, we will have Bernardo Aguilera from Chile. And the one following that one on November 15th, we'll also have Ana Palmero, who is a WHO consultant, and she works for the Ministry of Health in Argentina as well. I don't know, Sara, if we can just answer one last question, or are we out of time? Well, I've tried to group the questions as best as I can. I think a few of them may have gotten away from me, but just in my last review of these last questions relate to what you're talking about. Indicators are perhaps an acceptable middle point for all countries to try to achieve the stated objectives, but some questions are asking, how can we ensure that this governance go beyond research ethics, go beyond human research? How can we expand this to the entire spectrum of scientific integrity? Well, when we talk about topics of scientific integrity, then we see a transcendent uh, impact on health, and this permeates uh, research in general. And in this sense, in order to put into practice standards for scientific integrity, many institutions have collaborated with science and technology. And if, if you can't have a policy yet, but you can still come up with a series of definitions and try to identify those practices that should be avoided. But from a foundational standpoint, this is the perfect occasion to talk about it ensuring that research is always conducted in an ethical way is not something that can be achieved by a single health authority. This involves a network. This involves a distribution, adequate distributions of roles and responsibilities for all the relevant stakeholders. Even those who publish research on humans or any research at all. So we're looking at a broader more global vision that can once put in practice require teamwork and collaboration with other agencies and entities and address all the issues related to health and getting back to Bernardo's question about indicator number one and how it addresses 
the issue of research in health, which is not that different from biomedical research, but it is different in the sense that it includes epidemiological research uh, and other types of research that we knew that up to just before 2016 was part of a different document, a different instrument. So when we talk about health research, at least that that includes epidemiological research as well as biomedical research, as Bernardo mentions, this could leave out social science research, which isn't so directly related to health. So I think that in some way there is an ambiguity a basic ambiguity that is uh, present in SIOMS and all research uh, with human beings, regardless of whether it's health related or not, needs to include ethics. And so any people that participate in research need to be treated in an ethical way. This isn't something that needs to be restricted to research applied to health, but to research in general. But sometimes we know that it can be camp complicated for a health agency to try to create oversight beyond its borders and jurisdictions, so to speak. So historically speaking, the US Health Department, the common rule law that applies to research, it doesn't just apply to research and health, it applies to any research applied to human beings. And so when we look for the health and well-being of people, these two concepts don't need to be far removed from each other. And so in some of these cases, it can be a tenuous situation to try to create distinctions between health and violence, health or not health. The most suitable approach is to just look to achieve ethical treatment for any person that takes part in any kind of research, not just those that are involved in health research, so even when we talk about frameworks that talk about health research, the definition for research and the definition for the involvement of human beings is much broader and it goes to any kind of research being in, done on humans. I don't believe that there's a simple answer to all of this, but I believe that it's clear that any people-related research should be done ethically because not only are we trying to protect people's health but also their well-being and that is the broadest possible approach that we use when we do ethical review the fact that someone may lose their job as a, res as a result of being part of research is a risk that we have to take into account that is to say we're not limiting ourselves to health risk per se, we have occupational risk, socioeconomic risk. So by having this broader approach, we should make sure that all human research, even if it's not health related, knowing that it may be hard to make a distinction between health and not, not health, should be done ethically. And in if you go to the content of SIOM's guidelines, you will see that guidance is provided, provided for research uh, human research in the broadest sense of the term. Bien, muchísimas gracias. Very well. So thank you so much, Carla, for answering all of our questions. I believe that we have concluded with this uh, section. So I give the floor back to you for closing comments. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Argentina and Yamile. And thank you to our team of interpreters and the support team that make this this these discussions with our entire region possible so we would like to invite you to the session on november 8th to continue to be part of our regional research research ethics network thank you so much